to expect that you're going to get caught. Most of my client base should have known they were going to get caught. Most were repeat offenders. The fact of the matter is, the vast majority of people before the criminal justice system don't think that far ahead. They're driven by immediate gratification. So it doesn't matter how harsh the sentencing, it's never a deterrent. If harsh sentencing was a deterrent, there'd be no such thing as crime in California, Texas, or New York. All three states will sentence you to a thousand years in prison for multiple crimes. All three states have capital punishment. All three states have a three-strike rule. Third offense, boom, gone forever. All three states now spend more money in incarceration than they do in post-secondary education. You'd think that'd be a clue that they're doing something wrong. Separation of offenders from society's protection. Obviously, if you have somebody who's a threat to the public, you put them in a registry in prison, it's a pretty good way to make the public feel safe. Unfortunately, the reality is, the vast majority of people that are incarcerated are going to get out someday. So if we just pay the animals, what's going to happen when they get out? It's common knowledge that prisons are very much a university for crime. Recidivism is a huge problem. And the sad part about recidivism is that when a person is convicted for an offense, usually a popularly related offense on their first offense, after serving time and getting out, when they reoffend, their offenses are usually greater. They start moving against offenses against the person as opposed to property. If we only had a problem saying it's an evis of theft under and property theft, we wouldn't be having this discussion today. Because frankly, we can get insurance and just pay for the goods that are stolen. We're having this discussion today because the offenses in St. Kitts and Nevis have graduated to personal offenses. We live in fear in our community. So the next three are what we're going to focus on. Reparation, promotion of responsibility, rehabilitation. How does the traditional system do? Well, the problem with the traditional system is it utilizes the adversarial approach. The basic position is if we present the far right and the far left, the judge in the middle will find the truth in between. The system works greatest when you remove everybody who has a, uh, an issue with it. So what happens is crime is no longer crime against the person. It's now considered a violation of your social contract with the state. So if I hit Joe Blow in the mouth, when I'm charged, I'm not Joe Blow versus Dan McMullen. I am the crown. In Canada, DPP, AG, it's the state against Dan Hall. So, the victim is now replaced by the state. They're removed from the system altogether. They have a little bit of a speech at sentencing, but otherwise they're removed. The offender, well, the first thing he does is call a lawyer. So he's kind of removed as well. At the end of the day, the community are virtually non-players. So, reparation. Victim is replaced by the state. How genuine can reparation take place? Somebody steals from me, or somebody assaults me, they go to court, they're convicted, or they plead guilty, and they get fined $1,000. I go to court for my $1,000, and I'm told, not yours, the $1,000 payable to the crown. So how have I got any reparation out of this? I've still got a broken jaw, or I'm still on whatever that's stolen. I feel I've not only been victimized by the person who was stole from me, I've also been victimized by the state, because the money to put me in the position I was in before now belongs to the state. Even with victim compensation orders, they're generally based on the offender's ability to pay. So they need very little. So at the end of the day, the victim often feels further victimized. And we'll return to that in a little while. Promotion of responsibility, as I mentioned earlier. The main parties are already removed from the action. The victim is replaced by the state. His role becomes very minor. The adversarial approach works best when we have perfect professionals in all roles. So in comes the defense lawyer to counteract the prosecutor. Now as a defense lawyer, when a client called me at 3 o'clock in the morning and said he was in custody, I said, I'll give you three rules that you have to live by. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your big mouth shut. Keep your great big mouth shut. And as long as you follow those three rules and let me talk for you, you'll be okay. So, 
the accused is entirely removed from the approach. Now we're into the adversarial approach, and it becomes a game. When I won a case, I never returned to my office and said justice was done. My client was found not guilty. I returned and I said I won. When the prosecutor won a case, I never returned to my office and said justice was done. My client was convicted because he was guilty. I said I lost. We all have heard of the good lawyer who's never lost a case. It's a game. The other issue is that because it's a game and because the accused is removed and replaced by the defense lawyer, he starts to feel like he's persecuted as opposed to prosecuted. I can't tell you the number of times that I've gone back to my client because the Crown has refused the deal and my client has said, why do you have to get me? What do you mean? Well, they're out to get me. It's the not out to get you. You rob somebody, you clown. But they started feeling like they were the victims because this great big state was coming down on top of them. And that's a huge problem. In addition, guilty pleas are conditional. I've pled a lot of clients out. And I've always stood in the front and said, I've never stood in the front and said, my client is guilty because he has no morals and he likes victimizing people. I've always stood in front and said, my client's guilty, but he's got a dozen excuses. He's an addict. He's poor. He was abused as a child. It's always, I'm guilty, but. So rehabilitation. How can you rehabilitate somebody if they feel like they're persecuted? The very definition of rehabilitation is to change from doing something wrong to doing something right. Well, if I'm heading off to prison feeling persecuted, feeling I'm only here because the crowd is out to get me, I didn't do anything wrong, the only rehabilitation I do is to appease the authorities so I can get over it. The other issue is that the community has been completely removed from the whole situation. So Dan McMullen commits a robbery today. I get sentenced to Her Majesty's prison for 10 years. Over the past 10 years, I find Jesus, I take every opportunity to find programming. I end up in some training programs. I become the greatest welder that the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis has ever seen. After 10 years, I get out of prison. I return to McKnight. I go to apply for a welding job, and they say, get out of here, you dirty thief. The community has not been part of my rehabilitation. They still see the robber. They still see Dan the bad guy. So as such, they're not going to give me the opportunity. If the community was part of my rehabilitation program and recognized after I got out after 10 years that I wasn't no longer Dan the thief, Dan the victimizer, then I would have the opportunity to be successful in the community. But in reality, that rarely happens. And the end result is, those that will accept me is the gang that put me where I was to begin with. They'll open their arms to me because, again, they're my family. And once again, I'm back into that recidivism cycle. So if we focus on the adversarial approach, denunciation, deterrence, separation of the offenders from the public, what we get is a high recidivism rate. We see greater incarceration rates. And because we see higher recidivism rates, we see an increase in violent crime. And the biggest concern is our correctional system becomes a massive drain on our public coffers. And all we have to do is look to the United States. One of the presenters you'll meet later today, Ms. Melanie Nemo, the reason we brought her back is I love Melanie, because the first time I spoke to her, she said, I would love to come down and speak, but we can't give you any answers. We don't know the answers. We have made far more mistakes than we've had successes. So learn from our mistakes. And that is so important because quite often we have people show up with a turnkey and say, here's the turnkey solution. We spend a fortune implementing it and nothing changes. Because there's no such thing as a solution, nobody's found one yet. And that's why we're here today to be innovative and find it. Restorative justice, modern concept. When I first started practicing law, the term restorative justice was just coming to light. And it was being put out as, here's this brand new thing. 
When I got heavily involved in restorative justice, I started questioning, is it anything new, or is it an ancient concept? When I learned about the restorative justice, I learned from the Aboriginal nations in Canada, basically the Stone Age people. I learned about sentencing circles. I learned about the village. I learned about the role of the village elders. The role of the village, instead of probation officers, the village became the probation officer. And what it came down to is restorative justice, for all of the magic put around it, is nothing more than turning the clock back 2,000 years. Every race on earth, every nation on earth, started in a clanal or a tribal society. The difference between restorative justice and the usual justice is restorative justice looks at restoring the community. The fact of the matter is, my people, I knew McMullen. Back 300 years ago, I lived in Scotland, and we were part of the McDonald clan. The McDonald's were at war with the Campbells all the bloody time. If somebody in my ancestry got booted out of the tribe, it weakened the tribe. It weakened the clan. So it was only as a last resort that ancient traditional societies banished people. And banishment is nothing different than a term for prison. So restorative justice works from the concept of recognizing that crime is an illness in the community. Let's fix restore the community. Restorative justice, repair the harm done. The victim, repair the actual damage. Restoring sense of control over their lives. That's a huge issue. Quite often, somebody has their house broken into, thousand dollars are stolen, and somebody thinks they can repair the damage just by giving a thousand dollars back. What they forget is the people in that house, every time they hear a creak outside for the next three months, they think somebody's coming into their house. Restoration of the damage is a great deal more than simple monetary value. Recognize, rec restoration recognizes the damage caused by the criminal conduct far more than monetary loss. The offender. Restorative justice encourages the offender to take responsibility. I've participated in probably 50 sentencing circles. Don't have time to get into it today as to what they are, but when a client of mine stood up in the sentencing circle and said, I take responsibility, but it's because I was a drug addict, the circle wouldn't receive the sentence. They'd send them back to jail. Because their position was, you have not taken full responsibility as long as you're blaming something else. Dealing with the issues that contribute to the wrongdoing, repairing the harm. As you've just heard the gang members talk about, they talk about what put them into the gang to begin with, looking for the love, looking for the acceptance, looking for the recognition. All things that a healthy community naturally gives its members. The community. I couldn't figure out how to put the thing into three, three screens, so I had to do it. Denunciating wrongdoers' behavior. I have never seen denunciation done so effectively as I've seen in a sentencing circle. I have watched a man in a sentencing circle being sentenced for crimes, having spent most of his life in prison, and I've watched his eight-year-old child stand up in a circle because everybody is allowed to participate and say, Daddy, do you know how embarrassing it is to go to school and tell everybody that you're in jail? You start to see the real recognition of the wrong behavior. That his actions affect far more than just himself. His wife is embarrassed, his children is embarrassed, his community is embarrassed. Assisting the victims and offenders in the process of restoration. And we'll talk about that in a little while as well. Encourage development of respectful relationships between the wrongdoers, those who have suffered harm, and members of the community. Again, tying it all together. In essence, a community is greater than the sum of its parts. Three strong men individually can't lift the table. Three strong men together can lift the car. Clifford Olson, I like to point this guy out as a great example of the damage that the traditional system does. Clifford Olson was a serial killer in the early 80s of Canada. I think he killed something like 26 young ladies. He was prosecuted, and, or he was prosecuted, pled guilty to defenses in 1982. He was sentenced to life in prison. In Canada, life is life. But there's two provisions. You can make application for parole at 25 years, and there's also a provision in the criminal code called the Faint Hope Clause, where you're allowed to make application after 15 years. Very few people ever get it. Clifford Olson made application under the Faint Hope Clause for early parole. Now, 
The families of the victims had never got a chance to confront Clifford Olson because of what we just talked about, the criminal justice system. He was represented by a lawyer, and they were represented by the state. And they had this image of Clifford Olson being bigger than life. He was this huge, evil monster. And when he made an application for early parole for the Fame Oak Laws, the media was full of stories from the families, terrified that he was going to get his early release and he was going to come back and get them. <laughs> and so, by this time, the Canadian system had recognized that people should be able to confront them. They're accusers. So the victims, many of them, not the victims, sorry, the victims couldn't, the victims' families attended his parole hearing. And what they saw, instead of this great big monster, was this piece of crap broken down old man who was babbling like an idiot. Now when they walked away, they were still extremely vocal that he'd never be granted parole. But it was because of the crimes he committed, not because of their fear. It's a huge issue and an issue that the old system doesn't work on. Focus on the health of the community. We have an issue with Ganja in our community. Every country on earth has an issue with Ganja. When we speak to our youth in the schools, we tell them not to get involved in Ganja. And the reason we tell them is real simple. You're a 16-year-old track star. You're a successful athlete. You decided to celebrate after winning by going out and doing a couple joints. You get yourself charged, arrested, and convicted, and you end up with a Mickey Mouse $100 or $200 fine. Big deal, right? Until you're offered a scholarship to an American university as a track star, and you show up at the embassy in Barbados looking for your visa to enter the United States, they say, sorry, we have a zero tolerance policy. The end result? The future Kim Collins can no longer run. He returns to the U.S. where his educational opportunities are limited. And at the end of the day, doesn't become near what he could have become. So that Mickey Mouse little $200 fine has massive consequences that far outweigh the original offense. Can the principle of restorative justice be practiced without changing the court system? When I first started doing this presentation, I had this great presentation that talked about sensing circles, alternative dispositions, the whole kit and boodle, and I realized it was the wrong audience. I was trying to, it was a presentation more to address the judiciary and the magistrates, and so I shredded it and started over again. Yes, it is why we are here. The fact of the matter is the community is the basis of restorative justice, and it can act independent of the courts. Youth crime and violence, not a police problem, not a government problem. It is a community problem. Nobody is impacted more by crime and violence than the community itself. Assistance, intervention, and rehabilitation, where do they fit under the restorative justice system? Everything begins when it takes a village to raise a child. We use this saying in almost all of our presentations. Unfortunately, you have to start examining the health of the village that we have. And if you listen to that original presentation, it sounds like our villages are not very healthy. We're raising our children to be violent. We're giving no recognition in the community, no acceptance in the community. We, the community, need to build this village. The tools are forgiveness. It's why we open with the Lord's Prayer. Compassion, consideration, education, and love. Why do I say it's ideal for island states? We've got everything going for us to be very innovative when it comes to coming forward solutions. We've got a small population. We're geographically small as well. Now, I come from the nation of Canada. And I often say that we have lakes in Canada large enough that if you drop the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis into the lake, it wouldn't even raise the water level. And I say it jokingly, but it's true. So when you try to introduce a program in Canada, it's very difficult because the country is 5,000 miles across and 3,000 miles top to bottom. So it's very difficult to implement something to cover Canada. In addition to that, we have a large population, but more importantly, hugely, hugely multicultural. So every time you try and do something, you're going, thanks, hon. 
A lovely lady's my wife. I couldn't live without her. <laughs> Every time you try to introduce something, you're bound to offend somebody. So it's very difficult to be innovative. Here, even more important, is that we're not that far removed from the village community. We still refer to the village. When I go into a community and I'm talking about something, the community says, if you really want to make an impact, you got to talk to this person. you got to reach this individual. Because we still have recognized elders in our community that are more powerful than the politicians. They're more powerful than the church. They're more powerful than the educators because they're respected elders. We are so close to that village community that it would be so easy to implement things such as reporters through sort of justice room. Family relations bind the entire country. I am constantly baffled by the level of violence in this country. When I first started speaking with the inmates, I warned them that I am very candid when I speak. I don't believe in being flowery. I'm old, I'm cosby, I've got that right to be straightforward. And I said to them, I don't understand the violence. Because unless you're shooting somebody like me, who's not from here, you're hurting your own family. If Joe Weiber shoots Billy Herbert, chances are his grandmother took a prize at the funeral. Everybody here is related. And demographically, everybody's impacted here. In Canada, I can live in a city. I can live in a gated community and have no knowledge of the crime and violence whatsoever. Here, every one of us are impacted by it. Nobody is exempt. And that's why we all have a stake in addressing the situation and being creative. Desistance, intervention, and rehabilitation. The community has a, has a significant role at every aspect. Over the next two days, you're going to hear a great deal of information in these areas and others. And as Lawson said, don't let our facilitators leave with the information. Steal everything you can get off them. This is the right place to steal. <laughs> Melanie will lead you in a path exercise. She did that with us in uh, three years ago when we did our first uh, our conference. And it was amazing how successful it was. And people say these conferences never accomplish anything. But divisions know something was accomplished with that first conference. Because if you drive around Nevis now, graffiti is almost non-existent. And it's because a little group called the Renegades came out of that conference. And every time graffiti goes up, they go up and pay over it. And Nevis no longer has a gang presence in your face all of the time because the graffiti has been removed. Last year's conference was an amazing conference as well. And again, something came out. I always hope 10 things come out of something, but if one comes out of now. And we came out of last year's conference with a program called our secondary gang intervention program called Back Against the Wall. Now, that program was not only out of last year's conference, it was out of the year before as well, because Melanie was one of the consultants we used in helping develop it. And this year's conference is part of it as well. Because when we did the program last year, we realized where we were missing was we were not addressing anger management issues. But we don't know what we're doing. And so one of the people that we will be speaking to you tomorrow, Laverta Thomas from the John Howard Society of Canada, when she asked what we needed, I said we need training on how to do an anger management program. She says, got a great one, 10 weeks. She's going to come down Wednesday and Thursday, give us instruction on how to use it. We will augment that into our Discovery Club and into our Back Against the Wall program, filling those gaps, and we're going to see it being implemented in the prison. So, nothing comes out of it? Well, lots come out of these conferences, and they come out because the community is involved. Now, I'm going to finish this. Some of you don't know what the Back Against the Wall program is, and so I'll finish this oops, with a 10-minute presentation, and then we'll break for coffee. Oh, at the end of this, there's a plea for cash. It's because we put this together as part of our annual uh, fundraiser, our our, uh, our uh, silent auction. So, you know, just ignore us. If you want to throw money at us, we'll take it. But that's, that, that's not the intention.